What is up, threes, fours, and fives? It's Coach White. We're here to review. We're here to hack this test. We're here to break it down and take money from the colleges and put it in your pocket. Let's go. Today is our final unit for AP Human Geography. It's unit seven, and it's a big one. It's about development and industry. We're going to break it down into two parts. First, it's development. And I know what you're thinking. Development? What is that? It's hard to define. Development is basically, think of standard living, how easy it is to accomplish uh, an uh, a, a task in a country. So if you look at a country, there's many ways of measuring this, and they're called an index or indices. And one of the most common ones is known as GDP or the gross domestic product. And in this map of the world, which is GDP per capita, it breaks down the average goods and services produced per person in a country. So you'll notice the red countries produce more goods. Therefore, they earn higher salaries and wages. Therefore, they're more developed. The countries that are this more bland tan color produce less goods and services per person, and therefore they are less developed. And then you have the mid-range are more de or, uh, developing. You can also track it with healthcare. Sometimes I've seen in people per physician. So this is how many people will see one doctor. So think about it like this. You want the doctor ratio to be as close to one to one as possible, right? Have your own personal doctor. It's like being rich and famous. It's amazing. And then you'll go to some places in the world that are developing and there might be one doctor for every 10 or 20,000 people, which means healthcare is really burdensome down there. You can look at calories. So developed countries will eat more, whereas less developed countries might have some nutritional and malnutritional needs, okay? Uh, so you can see the same thing over and over again. You're seeing the developed parts of the world are generally in Western Europe. You can see it through uh, literacy rates. North America, um, parts of Japan, right, Australia, fossil fuels. Developed countries use more gas than uh, less developed countries. You can see that right here. So you're starting to see that all of these indices can be tracking how developed a country is. Total fertility rate. The more children a woman has, the less developed. It's an inverse relationship. You can see some of the most, some of the least developed places in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia because women have so many children there with the TFR. Whereas the most developed places, they'll have less children. They can focus on a career. You'll see again with healthcare that places where infants struggle to get to uh, adolescence or childhood uh, will also be an indicator of development, whether it's high or low. And so remember, there'll be less developed countries, more developed countries, and then you have like developing countries. All of this can be aggregated into one choropleth map seen here, and that's called the Human Development Index. And it takes all of this data and it puts it and aggregates it into one map by country here. And you can see that, and we see the most developed parts of the world are in this part of Europe, the Western part of Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and North America. And then you have some sort of scale of developing and less developed and least developed. So that's development. Now, how do we measure it? Uh, there's these models that will be measured, and there's two types of models in the world. Liberal models we see on the left and structuralist models we see on the right. And the liberal model that we're going to be looking at right now is called Rostow's Ladder of Development. And here it is for all the mathematical nerds out there. You can see showing time, past, present, and future. And then you have a scale of one to five. So five would be the most developed, one would be the least developed. And he said there's certain hallmarks or indicators you'll see in a country that will indicate to you whether it's developed or developing or least developed and things like that. So let's look at each stage. Let's start at the bottom and go to the top like Drake. Okay, so a traditional society is in stage one. Stage one, almost everyone in the society is doing subsistence farming. We can see that in this picture here of in Lesotho where 86% of the residents are engaged in some sort of agricultural practice without uh, co the commercial tools and fertilizers and things like that. So in stage one, it's subsistence, uh, it's low wages, right? Look around, you're not gonna see a ton of infrastructure, not a ton of roads, electricity, running water, schools, healthcare. It will not be robust. Then as a country or a place begins to develop, it'll move from traditional to what I call a gray area. And preconditions to take off is in stage two, where it means still a lot of people are farming, but maybe some new practices are starting to open up where people are farming more effectively. Like this lady, she discovered horses in a plow. So now no longer doing things by hand, they're using a little bit of ingenuity. So now less people are farming and more people can specialize. Stage two is followed by stage three. That's right, math nerd. And that is takeoff. And this is probably one of the most important stages in the modernization model because here a country will begin to industrialize, which means people shift from farming 
to working in factories. They start earning more wages. People shift from the countryside to the city. So you go from a rural to an urban. And uh, people are still farming. They're just using more machines. So we have a shift to machinery. Stage one, three, and then the five are very important in this. You have another gray area, stage four, drive maturity. This means that people start to use uh, high tech in order to unlock the mind and, and, and kind of bring and broaden uh, the horizons of business. But the last thing that will happen is in stage five, which is known as high mass consumption. This is when a society shifts again from manufacturing to more the service industries. All right, so let's review that. So in stage one, everyone's farming with low tech. Stage two, less people are farming with a little bit more tech. Stage three, very few people are farming with high tech equipment. Most people have now moved into factories and they're earning more wages living in the city. People eventually get tired of working in factories because it's loud, it's dangerous, and they want to work on their computers and swipe up and left and right and all those things. And they eventually will start working in the service industry, moving around, um, you know, finances and in doing this, these higher level order. Now, if you think back, right, Rossell's modern modernization model, right, you have stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five, that's going to be familiar. So keep that in mind as we push forward. If you don't remember the triangle of power, you have all of these types of economic activities. So you'll notice in stage one, everyone's farming. You'll notice the most basic economic activity is called primary, which means people are farming or fishing or my favorite lumberjacking. Then they'll move to secondary. Secondary shows that they are now stage three of Rossell's model. People have now stopped farming and they're now working in factories, turning those logs that the lumberjacks cut down into tables. And then People will move to services and what's known as high mass consumption or stage five of Rossell's model. That corresponds nicely to the top of this pyramid, which is split into three subsections. But this is all called tertiary. But if you really want to nerd out and five real hard, you can even break it down to quaternary and quinary. But in general, these are all services. You're using more of your mind. Secondary, you're using less of your mind, a little bit of your hand. Primary, you're using less of your mind, and even more hands. So think about moving up here. Wages are also directly correlated here. Primary, you earn lower wages. Secondary, moderate wages. Tertiary, high wages. But I don't understand any of that. I do understand IKEA, though. IKEA makes furniture out of trees. People don't want trees. How do you turn a tree into a desk named Billy? Well, you take the trees. You get the lumberjack to cut them down. They put them on a truck. They get to the factory on the trucks. So the trucks would be a service, which is tertiary. But the factory and mill is manufacturing, which would be secondary. So we see all of that. Now, if you really want to get in the weeds here, inside of the IKEA are the brains because there is a distribution center that looks like this that moves your little billy table all over the world. And someone is sitting there working on how to move it more efficiently. There's also someone who's super big brained at the top doing R&D. Look at this guy, right? He's got beakers, he's got lab coat, he's got safety goggles because we know safety is first, second, and third. And he is trying to make, along with all of his other researchers, they're making better and better chairs and bookshelves and all that stuff at Ikea. So we can see all of those going. So all of this relates to the Rossell's modernization model. Now, some of the other models are known as structuralists, and that's the dependency theory and the world systems theory. What these both um, assert is that because of colonization, the European and North American countries went out and they took over less developed countries and they removed their resources, they removed a lot of these goods, and they became very powerful very quickly. Uh, and that it's a vestige of colonialism. We see that now what is created is the inequity we see here because the core countries are the ones that went out and they did these things and they were able to build these vast infrastructure and networks of trade and development and factories and, and transportation. The periphery is where they were taken from. So parts uh, usually around the equator, right? South America, um, Africa, and Southeast Asia. The periphery are what's had stuff taken. And because of this, these two systems both assert that not every country will be able to develop fully because the core countries will stay in control and the semi-periphery countries will stay in the middle and the peripheral countries will stay at the bottom due to a tough climate and the fact that they're working for these more developed countries. So those are our three models we're looking at. Rostals, which is more than likely going to be on the test in May, and then the dependency and the world systems model. Make sure you understand what core, periphery, and semi-periphery are.
Now, how does this all relate to women? Because I always say in class, if you just know how the women are treated, you can probably know is this a really developed country or a less developed country. So if women are treated very well, you're probably in a more developed country. If women are treated poorly, you're in a less developed country. That's really simple. We can see this cartogram right here to look at the gender inequality index. So places that are closest to zero, that means there'll be the biggest or the least amount of differences between male and female uh, treatment. And we can see that the, the more blue a country is, the more equality that exists between men and women and types of jobs they can get. Whereas the warmer these colors get, the less equality there is. So we already know that the cooler the color, the more developed. The warmer the color, the less developed. And that all goes back to this gender inequality index. So it looks at things like mortality rates, the CBR, the TFR, life expectancy, access to birth control, income, types of jobs women can and cannot have. And those all go back to that gender inequality index. And the last thing that's always included is the UN has these 17 goals. I know they couldn't pick a nice round number like 10 or five or 20. They chose 17, right? I guess they love prime numbers, right? That's my only math I know. But here are the goals. And if every country could achieve these goals, you would have what is called high development worldwide. Now, the last thing we gotta look at in Unit 7 is industry. It's the peanut butter to development's jelly. It's the you to your bay, right? They need each other and they go hand in hand. So industry started about 250 years ago in a place called England. You've probably heard of it. But before the Industrial Revolution, it was known as cottage industries. That's where things were made by hand with rudimentary machines in the home. The Re Industrial Revolution began because of Britain's colonial holdings. So they had all of these these goods around the world, they had cotton, they had tea, they had tobacco, they had sugarcane, and all of these raw materials or primary goods were flowing from all of their colonies into Britain. And Britain was trying to process them. And they were doing it by hand, but it's a little slow because they were trying to engage in what's called mercantilism, which is trading for gold and silver. But then they realized that with certain resources like coal and iron ore, they could turn uh, these wooden fires into coal fires. They could get hotter. They could make these iron and steel structures, which are going to be more robust and stronger and more productive. And so what happens is Britain actually starts to create a new way of making things. And they use the iron to, to make the engines. They use the coal to run the fires. And they use James Watt's improved steam engine to replace the human or animal power from previous times, even water power up until that point. Because if you look here, early 1700s, we have what's known as this uh, animal husbandry here. Then right before that, you have water wheels. So a lot of the factories are located along rivers and Britain has lots of rivers. The last thing is steam power, which means England is now producing at a much more industrial level and they're able to just take off and spread their industrial wings and fly away and become one of the richest countries in the world. England made a mistake here. They decided to throw themselves a party to show everyone how awesome they are. Because of this party at Crystal Palace at the World's Fair, the diffusion of the Industrial Revolution spread, we can see mostly eastward, and eventually it went all over the world. So the entire world will start to industrialize, all because of this little party they threw. And how it's done is neither here nor there in this video, but you can check out these other videos, I'll link in the description below, where I talk about the basics of industry and then how industry is done today. So I'll call it old school industry, new school industry. Look for those links below. Make sure you drop a like, right, and subscribe because you know I'm trying to pay some bills, all right? So that's that. I do wanna to talk to you about industrial models. Look at these hot industrial work. Wait, that's the wrong model. Look at these industrial models now. They're not as hot as the others, but they will show you where businesses and factories tend to locate. All right, so these are all about location. The first one we're going to look at is called Weber's Least Cost Theory. And Alfred Weber was a very, um, you know, kind of angry looking man, but he believed that there was three things in, in creating a, a business. Cheap labor, cheap transportation, and the agglomeration of markets of similar and like goods. So in this, you want to keep transportation balanced like this. You've probably seen the Thirsty Town one. That one's a really lame example. This is a much better example. And you have the raw materials. You're transporting them to the factories. The factories process them. Then they ship them to the market where the consumer goes and buys them. So we have primary, secondary, and tertiary markets. But sometimes what happens is you need to move the factory based upon the weight of the goods. So you have bulk gaining and bulk reducing goods. So an example would be bread. 
So bread comes from wheat and sugar, and all of these things are very light at first, but they're added together. So you want to ship the, the goods while it's it's very uh, light the long distance to save money. Then as it gets to the bakery, everything's added together and baked. And while bread seems light, comparatively, it's much heavier. That way you're shipping a short distance to your market. Plus, it has a shelf life because it's a food product. Conversely, Ikea, which you know I love, has very heavy goods, right? The logs are very heavy in the initial phase. So they're shipped a short distance. Then they're milled and planed or bulk reduced. They become lighter and lighter as they turn them from tree into Billy Bookshelf. Then they're shipped a long distance to you and I here at this wonderful Swedish paradise known as Ikea Furniture. All right. Now let's look at it in the triangle. So sometimes if we're making bread, we would put the factory or bakery close here so it stays better. Then the opposite would the factory be here. So you're seeing where transportation is a key here in saving money. So in the bulk gaining example, the factory is very close to the market. In the bulk reducing example, the factory is very far from the market and close to the source where the goods are heavier to begin with. That's the harder one to understand. The second industrial model is called hoteling. And this one everyone loves, all right? Think about something you love. I love fast food hamburgers. So we got Big Boys Burgers and Burger Boy because I can't get sponsored right now, right? And they're at location A and C, but if they would do what's called agglomerate, which means move near each other, they could actually earn more money. Now, why is that? You would think they would steal from each other, but what's actually happening is they're creating a lot of centrality, a lot of magnetism around this location because even if someone's showing up to buy a Burger Boy and there's a line, Big Boy's Burgers can also serve them something that's a substituted good, all right? We've all seen this right here. This is a, a random exit on in a highway, we see there's lots of gas stations and there's lots of food and there's lots of hotel and there's lots of nothing else. So that is what's called locational interdependence. All of these places need each other. They're locationally interdependent, which means if one moves, they both suffer. If they move closer together, they both will um, be become much better. All right, well with that, you now know everything that could be on unit seven on that AP test that I hope you slaughter in May. That is development and industry and I'm Coach White and I'm wishing you best Good luck. Don't procrastinate too much. Good luck.